Okay, Dobro Jutro, good morning to everyone. We're ready to begin our second day. So I hope you've had a good, night, good night's rest. We have two very good panels uh, prepared for you um, today. And uh, I'll repeat that uh, we certainly encourage your participation and uh, asking questions to the to the panelists that'll make uh, our job easier and maybe the discussion livelier and uh, more interesting so please don't hesitate um, to ask questions so we're beginning today with a panel on uh, national sovereignty this is an important issue uh, croatia paid a very high price for achieving independence and um, having our own country uh, we we should take sovereignty seriously uh, we've been denied our national sovereignty for most of our history, in fact. For centuries, we were ruled by uh, foreign powers. And so um, I think it is appropriate to uh, begin the second day with this topic. topic. Robert will introduce as moderator the uh, distinguished speakers we have. Uh, John O'Sullivan is here. He'll make his way down uh, from the, the lobby shortly. So again, um, in the Un European Union, these um, questions are of, I would say, uh, critical importance. Uh, we have a in new incoming government in Italy. We have also the reality, in my view, that the Brussels elite has not learned the lessons from Brexit, and many um, continue in a very condescending manner to treat uh, other nation states like uh, Hungary and Poland. And this is unacceptable in our view, completely unacceptable. The European Union should be a community of independent nations. The nation state remains essential for the democratic process. There is no European uh, public, so to speak. Uh, it, politics is all, in the end, uh, national, even more local. So these are issues uh, I think we will discuss. And like I said, Croatia, as the newest member of the EU, EU should be paying attention to what's happening uh, outside of our country, where these debates are, are ongoing. So that's all for me as an introduction. I'll give the floor to Robert. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, and as, as Stephen has already said, you know, the issue of national sovereignty is perhaps at, at the core of, of what we're fighting today here in Europe. I mean, when, when we look at the uh, gradual erosion of sovereignty as more and more powers are handed to the uh, European Union, it's always worth remembering that the original vision should always, for the European Union should always be that of a Europe of nations rather than a nation of Europe. Uh, and to discuss this incredibly important issue, we have a very esteemed panel. Uh, Robin Harris is the co-founder and vice president of the Center for Cultural Renewal here in Croatia. Uh, and before that, he was a, a Thatcher, uh, sorry, an advisor to uh, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who was also a founder of New Direction. Um, Mario Fantini is the editor of the European Conservative magazine, which is a print, quarterly print journal of all things conservative and centre-right in Europe. Uh, and I highly recommend subscribing to it, least of all, because occasionally there's a contribution from us in there. Uh, and then finally, John O'Sullivan, who will join us shortly, uh, is the president of the Danube Institute in Budapest in Hungary, uh, and was previously also a, an advisor to Margaret Thatcher, and also the editor of National Review magazine, which is a very influential conservative magazine in uh, the United States. Uh, but without further ado, I'll hand over to Robin Harris first. Thank you, Robert. Well, national sovereignty, it's a phrase that rolls easily off the tongue, often with a touch of contempt. If you're a globalist, 
and usually as so-called national sovereignty. The so-called is there, of course, to suggest that in the modern world, nations or states cannot be sovereign in any meaningful sense. Sovereignty is therefore an idea that appeals only to blockheads and primitives like us. In fact, if there were no such thing as sovereignty, no substance intellectually or politically, you'd hardly think that so many people would keep on writing about it as they do. An awful lot of what is written is wrong. By that I mean not that I don't agree with it, although I don't, but rather that it is historically inaccurate and intellectually flawed. And this is because the historians are not usually writing the history and the political philosophers usually have a political axe to grind. Now I want to look in some detail at both what we mean by sovereignty, which involves what we mean by the state, and then at what we mean by nation and nation state. And after that, I'll draw out a few implications for our affairs today, though my colleagues uh, here will have much more to say on those matters, I know. For example, it is written that sovereignty is a modern concept developed inter internally in the Reformation era and solidified externally by the Treaty of Utrecht in 1648, which ended the Thirty Years' War and so the wars of religion in Europe, based on the principle of cuius regio eus religio. That is, the ruler determines the religion of his subjects and religion is thus subordinated to secular power. <coughs> but, but, there was sovereignty in the Middle Ages. The kings of England, for example, would have been most put out to be told that they were not sovereign. And if you said that, you might well finish up on the scaffold, which is inadvisable. The king, when he was acting with the full authority of his office in council, consulting his barons, who developed over time into the House of Lords, which developed in time into uh, Parliament, the king was the source of all law. He could do no wrong. That was the legal doctrine. He could do no wrong. And that was the model applied more or less in the whole of Christendom. We have, however, right at the beginning to distinguish sovereignty from power. The two are related, but they're not the same. Sovereignty is absolute authority. Its exercise may in practice be subject to many conditions. So a sovereign's power is not necessarily absolute. Only totalitarian 20th century states claimed absolute authority and sought to exercise absolute unconstrained power. In this, the totalitarian state was doing what totalitarians always do, it was behaving as if it was God. The suggestion that the medieval world knew no sovereignty, though, as I've said, false, contains this much truth. Our Christian forebears believed that only God was ultimately sovereign, in that he has absolute authority and absolute power. So only God, if we believe in him, of course, only God has the right to do and the power to do whatever he pleases. Moreover, God's laws, the moral code, the law of nature, whatever you want to call it, apply even, perhaps they apply particularly to kings, that is, earthly sovereigns. Popes in the early and high Middle Ages made claims that echoed something of this concept of divine sovereignty in the form of what they described as 
plenitudo potestatis, the fullness of power. But without going into any details, I can just tell you that they didn't get very far in the attempt. So sovereignty, uh, in a word, is a very old concept, but it has been updated several times. The English writer Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century may be said first to have modernized it. Hobbes, probably an atheist, dispenses with all divine sanction for rulers. By what seems to me a delicious paradox, Hobbes argues that although based upon a primeval social contract with the ruled, necessity requires that the sovereign must be personal and absolute, in other words, the king. The alternative, according to Hobbes, is anarchy, an existence which he famously described as where life was nasty, brutish, and short. Well, the social contract proved more lasting than Hobbes's argument for absolutism. It was taken up by John Locke, arguing for individual rights against the state before the 1688 so-called glorious, perhaps better described as Protestant revolution in England. And then by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, asserting the sovereignty of the people exerted through what Rousseau calls the general will. With Locke, we branch out to the doctrine of popular sovereignty associated with the American Revolution. With Rousseau, we arrive at the brand of what's been called totalitarian democracy associated with the French Revolution. Both the American and the French revolutions bring us nearer to our subject today, namely national sovereignty. In both cases, however, there resulted problems for Europeans, some of which are very topical still. The founders of the United States, we should remember, were largely members of the British political class. They thought in British terms. Hence, they avoided any definition of who exactly the people are. The people, uh, obviously, in their view, excluded slaves, and they excluded what we are no longer able to call Red Indians. Um, but beyond that, um, they did not define the matter. The problem, however, is that this ambiguity between people, in the general sense, and a people, a specific people in the particular sense, which is always present, I think, in every language, for example, with the use of the word narod in Croatian, this ambiguity and this problem goes altogether unrecognized by Americans. Nowadays, nation and its derivatives, national and so on, are used, the word used by Americans without any reference to historic identity, to blood ties, to geography, to language, and to all the other elements that are essential as a European, especially Central European and East European, uh, understands the idea of nationhood. A nation is simply for Americans, the people who happen to live in a state. Now, as for the French Revolution and the baleful influence of Rousseau, the deliberate elision of the majority with the people and its claim exercised through demagogues to plunder and overturn existing institutions and traditions, this concept of the general will is at the root of all the horrors that the European continent has known, including communism. Rousseau's assertion that the general will is infallible, which is what he says, infallible, it cannot be wrong, is an echo of the medieval tag, vox populi, vox dei, the voice of the people is the voice of God. But in medieval times, it was never used without many, many conditions applied. And in practice, this concept, this Rousseau concept, has added enormously to the potential for collectivist tyranny.
Now, I want to highlight the way in which sovereignty, despite Hobbes's exciting provocations, and I think he knew they were provocations even when he was writing, uh, how sovereignty developed in Britain. And this was in practice healthier uh, and very different. And it also incidentally explains why Britain could never share the outlook prevalent in mainland uh, European states. And the best book on this subject, if you wish to pursue it, remains that of the Victorian legal thinker A.V. Dicey, Introduction to the Study of the Law of the Constitution. In the British system, <clears throat> as Dicey explains, it is Parliament which is sovereign, in the sense that Parliament makes laws that bind. Parliament, the word, is shorthand for uh, the king in Parliament. That's the phrase, the king in Parliament. The royal sovereign's prerogative powers have, in effect, apart from in a small number of cases, been handed over to Parliament, mainly the House of Commons, and to the Prime Minister. Parliament, as a result of this sovereignty, cannot be bound by any other institution or any treaty or any formal agreement. One Parliament cannot bind the next. Dicey, I think, rather shockingly says, but he proves, to my mind, that Parliament can give up its sovereignty altogether. It can commit institutional suicide. And that, as he says, is what happened at the beginning of the 18th century when the English Parliament abolished itself uh, and uh, joined under the Act of Union with Scotland to become what is today's British Parliament. But Parliament cannot, but Parliament cannot share sovereignty because it can always unilaterally take back any authority that it has bestowed. So all the talk of pooling sovereignty, as it's described, pooling sovereignty, which was used to persuade the British to enter the European common market, uh, and is still rather dispiritingly heard in other contexts, is what another British thinker this time of the 18th century, Jeremy Bentham described memorably as nonsense on stilts. The sovereignty of Parliament would then, on the face of it, appear to be the same as the sovereignty of the British nation, but not quite. This is because, adds Dicey, there are limits imposed by the fact that members of Parliament have been popularly elected so they must have regard to those who chose them. And also because some laws would simply not be obeyed. Now this, as you can immediately see if you followed the argument, and you sh as you should accept from me if you haven't followed the argument at all, this is not very satisfactory. And indeed, later in his life, Dicey extolled the merits of a confirmatory popular referendum to agree or to overturn certain constitutional decisions by Parliament. The different referendums that have occurred in the United Kingdom were not of a Dicean kind because they were all, in theory, advisory. Their rationale was either that certain issues are beyond party politics and need direct reference back to the nation, or simply that one party or the other thought a referendum was a useful political device in the circumstances. David Cameron thought like that when he offered a referendum because he wished to ditch the threat from the UKIP party, UK Independence Party, on the issue of the European Union. But of course, the whole thing went spectacularly wrong and the electorate disobeyed orders from the establishment and voted no. Well, Britain should have never have joined the European Common Market, as it was then called in 1971. Leaving it was, in fact, a belated response to the logic of Britain's historic position, that is, its parliamentary sovereignty, which was lost through the primacy of European law, and a response to its global rather than European 
trading focus. Unfortunately, Brexit didn't lead to the removal of all the shackles imposed by Brussels. It didn't see a rebirth of economic liberty. It did allow the UK to acquire quickly and uniquely sufficient vaccines at the start of the COVID crisis. But partly because of the UK's heavy-handed and statist response to that crisis, now being extended to the energy crisis, incidentally, and also because Boris Johnson signed Britain up to this uh, slogan objective, carbon net zero, with, in Boris's case, zero appreciation of the costs. The opportunities of Brexit have, in fact, been squandered. We'll see uh, whether they are put to greater use under the new government. Anyway, let me say something now about the relationship between sovereignty and power. Sovereignty, and this is a point that you Croats should get into your heads if I may say so, sovereignty is internally, not externally determined. It is an internal fact. It was therefore an error, in my view, for Croatia to celebrate in such a grand manner the anniversary this year of international recognition of its republic, because it suggests a lingering lack of self-confidence, a desire always to be accepted by somebody else. On the other hand, it's clearly meaningless for the representatives of a nation, any nation, to declare their sovereignty if they have no power to enforce it and use it. The Montevideo Convention of 1933 usually regarded as the key document on the matter, says that the state, to be a state, must have a permanent population, a defined territory, a government, and the capacity to enter relations with other states. But the important point is, in my mind, its existence, the existence of this state is independent of recognition by those other states. This is a really important qualification. Now, sovereignty, as I say, can be extinguished, but not shared. Specific aspects of sovereignty can be lost for good. The power to issue your own currency is perhaps the most topical. Croatia has just introduced, or is introducing, the euro in place of the kuna. And there's been a certain amount of discussion in the press here about whether that will affect prices in the shops and so on. But this issue is trivial and really, behind, really beside the point. The crucial point is that the state, the Croatian state, has given up forever, forever, ladies and gentlemen, the right to issue its own currency. There is no legal provision for a state that enters the Eurozone to leave it, nor probably would it simply be allowed to do so. The loss of the currency will not just mean the end of monetary sovereignty, but in due course, the reduction, and then probably under some new legal provision, the loss of fiscal sovereignty. This is full of political implications for all of you who are involved in any way at all in the politics of Croatia. Well, the other element of our topic today, national sovereignty, is of course the nation, what we mean by it. Unlike in the aftermath of the First World War with the League of Nations, the United States, with British support after World War II, committed to a new realistic architecture of international relations. This was based on the United Nations with the UN Security Council, of which the five militarily strongest powers in the world were permanent members, each with a veto. Idealists, or as I would prefer to call them utopians, have regularly tried to change or challenge this setup, pointing out, as they do now, that one or more unsavory regimes in this uh, permanent, permanent membership of the Security Council can stop high-minded interventions that it doesn't like, which is true. Other elements. Well, the growth of supranational jurisdiction overruling national courts, 
I'll wait until this discussion's ended. Right, the growth of supranational uh, jurisdiction overruling national courts, a host of apparent threats which allegedly require global action, climate change is the looming catastrophe at the moment, and uh, as we'll hear more about, uh, an aggressive leftist liberal ideology that refuses to recognize the validity of any traditional structures, all these elements mean that there is in fact now less respect for national sovereignty than at any time since the end of the war. Well, many historically minded commentators have pointed out that it's paradoxical that conservatives in Europe nowadays are by and large nationalists, because in a previous era, conservatives strongly opposed nationalism. In continental Europe, Germany, Italy, Hungary, and indeed Croatia, the leaders of nationalist movements were certainly all self-identified liberals. They, frustrate, they represented a frustrated middle class. They disliked not just empires, and most, though not all, monarchies, but also they disliked religious authority and much of traditional hierarchy. Yet this paradox that's pointed out by our critics isn't really so striking if you look more closely. This is because nations did not, contrary to what is sometimes said and written now, emerge with the Enlightenment or with the 19th century. Nations certainly existed before they were subject to opinion polls or regimented into administrative units. You might say that these were just tribes, but that's simply a verbal distinction. Nation, the word, refers to what one is born, natus, not what one becomes by acquired citizenship, civis. In English English, as opposed to American English, we preserve this distinction. For example, I, Robin Harris, am a Croatian citizen, but I am an Englishman by birth. I am therefore not, in English English, a Croat. Now, nations begin to be visible, albeit in glimpses, in the late Middle Ages. Shakespeare's play, Henry V, with its great patriotic English themes, is uh, written later than the events of the early 15th century that are described, but the English patriotism you find in that play is authentic and of the original period. Henry V was the first Anglo-Norman king of England who wrote his personal letters in English. He felt English, he was English. The European universities at this time recognized students according to what were called their nations, nations explicitly, referring to identities determined by location and language. The elements of nationhood, common language, by and large religious faith, geographical location, and less tangibly, but I would say more importantly, habits, traditions, loyalties, all these things were not contrived by 19th century nationalists. Now this, I suggest to you, is a tremendously important fact for us conservatives. The nation is the receptacle of the values, in the fullest sense, the culture, the culture, as in the title of the organization, which I'm pleased to be an element, the culture that makes us what and who we are. We are rooted in it. It is metaphorically, not just physically, in our blood and bones. Now there's another point, not very glorious perhaps, but worth admitting. And this is that the nation is almost all that conservatives in many areas have left to cling on to. Why? Well, the traditional family, one man, one woman, married, usually once, plus children, usually, and the Christian faith, almost always, are certainly more important institutions in a European conservative's life than is the nation. True. These are the pillars on which the rest of the edifice stands. 
but both the family and the faith are being shaken and in the West being crushed by a multi-pronged attack. Now, religion, and I'm thinking here of my own religion and probably most of yours, Catholicism, has lost the will or perhaps the conviction to speak up for itself in the public square, even in Croatia. And this is, of course, particularly true under the present Pope, who has an animus against conservatives of any kind. National identity is therefore our last political bastion. It's where we are taking our stand. It is the redoubt from which we must launch, unless we wish to disappear altogether, the required counter-revolution. Peaceful, peaceful counter-revolution, let me add, before Mr. Plenkovich sends in various uh, um, policemen to drag me away as a terrorist. Peaceful counter-reformation, but no less energetic than the assaults currently directed against conservative values by the new globalist liberal establishment. In Central and Eastern Europe, and Southeastern Europe here, I would say particularly, nationhood, the reality is, has always been inflammable. Nationalism from the mid 19th century contained plenty of opportunities for conflict. The national awareness at this point in the 19th century was sharpened by the fact that people had more to do with their neighbors through new communications, transport, and so on, and they often concluded that they really didn't like or trust them very much. But the making of states is always a tense and messy and frequently bloody business. We only fight for what we love, and if we do not love the community of which we are a part, it's weak and so are we. The relationship between national identity, statehood, and democracy in Central and Eastern Europe is also complex. Now, I couldn't summarize it now even if I wanted to, but anyone who thinks that states can be run satisfactorily without considering that complexity, as I say, particularly in this part of the world, is a fool. The Habsburgs ruled through what to modern eyes seems an extraordinarily complicated system of dualism, that's Austria-Hungary, subdualism, the subordinate units to that duo, of which Croatia was one. Political nations or peoples, as the phrase is, political nations or peoples, politički narod, and minorities. Now, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the concept of constitutive nations, which is the successor of the political nations, politički narod, is the basis of the state the post dayton state, though who has sovereignty there, I really could not say. Nationalism, we should also uh, accept, I think, uh, is not always democratic. It, it may just be majoritarian, a concept completely uh, uh, beyond the understanding of the British and Americans. It may be just majoritarian. It may not even be that. The great and glorious, not mocking, it was a great and glorious 1848 Hungarian revolution was not democratic in certain respects. Just ask the Croats. During the, let me say, I find a particularly nice little uh, insight, whether the niceness of it will be appreciated in Budapest, I don't know, John can comment on that. During the later so-called crisis of dualism, there was always some kind of crisis going on, in the early 1900s, which pitted the Budapest nationalist politicians against Vienna over the joint army, particularly the issue of the word of command, Franz Josef threatened to introduce, what did he threaten to do? He didn't threaten to put in the army, he didn't threaten this, he didn't threaten that. He threatened to introduce a modified universal suffrage. He threatened to introduce democracy, effectively. This was greeted with outrage by the Hungarians because it would have enfranchised the majority non majors And the best way of reading about this, incidentally, is through the wonderful and brilliantly translated novel by Miklos Banfi, uh, the first and two uh, elements of which, uh, of the, uh, in what is called the Transylvanian Trilogy. Now, if the Habsburgs, I would suggest, uh, had been left after 1918, 
to create a loose confederal, probably trialist structure, as the Slavs and Croats wanted. The traumas of the 20s and 30s might well have been avoided, but Versailles and Trianon created a new world. And then, with the rise of National Socialism and the outbreak of war, the underlying national hostilities erupted into blood feuds, as we know in this part of the world. The Nazis divided, and they ruled, and they exterminated. And finally, they also discredited nationalists of all sorts in the territory they dominated to the benefit of the communists. Well, communists tried to destroy nations, though they often had to play at being nationalists, particularly when their policies were failing. Uh, Stalin, Tito and others played that patriotic card when required. But it was a sham. Marxism-Leninism does not regard nationhood as other than a temporary bourgeois construct. construct. Now, from all this, the captive nations only emerged at the end of the Cold War. There were then three obstacles that they faced. The first was the difficulty of getting rid of the old communist elite. Now here, in Croatia, but indeed in the whole of the former Yugoslavia, lustration, as this process is called for those of you who are not Croats, uh, lustration was not even tried. Not even tried. Uh, elsewhere, it was tried, in some places more effectively than others, but at least it discredited, even if it didn't fully remove the old communist networks. That was one problem. Secondly, there was a basic lack of Western understanding of how national self-determination is a central aspect of freedom, and that human rights without nationhood turn out to be either a pipe dream or a smokescreen for communists. And the history of Western policy towards the breakup of Yugoslavia is a good illustration of that. Third, there was and is the very special and pressing problem of the European Union, which is enthralled to its own supranational ambitions, and about which much could be said that I have no time to say now. But these points are worth absorbing or reminding ourselves of. The origins of the European Union from before the Treaty of Rome, but reinforced subsequently, have determined its orientation since. Europe, as we call it, was conceived as a Franco-German partnership, a series of cartels, monopolies, quasi-monopolies, and a construct in which the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy was to drive proceedings rather than politicians. They added on the politicians later on. The aim was to restrict and eventually suppress national sovereignty which is why this new legal order, this new legal sovereignty, was created. The later developments and the articulation of that objective by, among others, Helmut Kohl, of what he explicitly called the United States of Europe, just follows that line. The attempt by Britain under Mrs. Thatcher in the late 80s to establish the European community as a framework for cooperation by sovereign states was rejected effectively in the Maastricht Treaty. The Thatcher vision potentially appealed to the former communist countries, which had no wish to lose the sovereignty that they had regained. But it must be said that they didn't try very hard to resist the formula from Brussels and Berlin that why, and uh, Paris, that widening, as it was called, must mean deepening. That means centralizing power. As with Croatia today and its dealings with Europe, it's the menu on offer, not the well-known dangers of accepting a free lunch that determine the outcome. So is it too late? Could Europe still become a framework in which national sovereignty is respected? And the answer to that is that I just don't know. I do know that the conditions for achieving that will be 
resistance to threats from Brussels by Poland and Hungary, strengthening of the Visegrad group, more intellectual self-confidence by European conservatives, and the education of public opinion about the arguments for our topic, the sovereign nation state. Thanks. Thank you.